Welcome to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Bob Dancer is America's premier video poker writer and teacher. He's written 10 books, including Video Poker for the Intelligent Beginner and the best-selling Million Dollar Video Poker. He helped develop the computer software Video Poker for Winners, and in 2004, he was inducted into the Video Poker Hall of Fame. Richard Munchkin has been a professional advantage player for over 30 years and is in the Blackjack Hall of Fame. His book, Gambling Wizards, Conversations with the World's Greatest Gamblers, is a testament to the many ways you can succeed at gambling. The goal of the show is that you'll be a more knowledgeable gambler tomorrow than you were yesterday. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good morning. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is legendary Las Vegas bookmaker Jimmy Vaccaro, who today helps run the South Point Sportsbook. There are lots of sports radio shows, and we're not one of them. So we're going to be asking Jimmy to touch on subjects that probably won't be covered in most sports shows. We'll be talking to Jimmy in a few minutes. Last week, there was a cheating scandal at the World Series of Poker, which for the most part has not made the major mainstream press. In the $10,000 buy-in, heads-up, no-limit hold'em game, a Moldavian player named Valerie Coca, and it's possible I'm unintentionally butchering his name, he beat several players heads-up. These players noticed fishy things going on, and when they spoke to each other, they confirmed that they believed Coca was cheating. It was reported to the World Series of Poker, who attacked the accusations with vigor, but so far, no clear evidence of cheating has surfaced. Richard. Yeah, I mean, from the reports, it sounds like the guy was actually a very amateurish uh, at, at marking the cards. So he was wearing sunglasses. He would touch the cards on the backs, switch the cards around, touch the other card on the back. He would. He kept going back uh, to look at his cards and touching them, a and it just. Um, I really wonder how much the World Series is trying to just bury this under the rug as quickly as possible. It'd be a disaster for them for this to show up on the NBC nightly news or whatever, um, and and how much they're really doing about it. Um, players did further investigation and found that this guy has been barred from all the casinos in Czechoslovakia for marking cards. Um, the player then came out and said, no, that's not true. I was only barred from one casino. Um, but it, it, it does not sound good. I mean, it sounds like cheating happened. And, and I also, the, the World Series is saying that they are investigating this. My thoughts are, would they even know what to look for? You know, with the amount of money involved, why don't they have somebody who's knowledgeable about cheating, uh, watching these, these games? And the other thing is I have a friend who was a dealer over there who said when they come off the table, those cards just go into the back. They're not marked what table they were, wa they were on or for what hours they were on which table. They just go into a big pile. So them finding the deck that was used against those particular players is going to be a needle in a haystack. Um, they go through 30,000 decks or something there. So, um, And after the accusations went down, he knew he was under surveillance, and he played it clean. And, of course, those decks were checked later, and there was no marks on those whatsoever. Right, and he lost. Um, so, um, I would, would think there's going to be some changes in procedures, such as the decks in the future are marked. This deck was used on table 37 from 10 to 11 in the morning on June 9th. That's and what they should do. They're also talking about banning sunglasses, which, you know, I mean, you can wear contact lens It's uh, to read. I mean, there are certain types of um, daubs that can be read, you know, with sunglasses, but they could also be read using contact lenses. So barring sunglasses isn't going to solve any problem. All right. Let's go on to another subject. Uh, we got an email, gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com. A uh, recreational blackjack player comes and plays basic strategy with his brother. He wants to know if his money will last longer if they play on the same table or different tables. Richard. 
Yeah, so there's definitely correlation between your bets, right? If the dealer has a blackjack, you both lose at the same time. If the dealer busts and you still have a hand, you both win at the same time. Um, so, yeah, yes, your money would last longer, but isn't the point to come out and have fun with your brother? Um, you know, I, I don't think you should be worried about uh, that correlation, or if that is really what you're worried about, then go play craps and bet opposite each other. You know, uh, your money will last a lot longer that way, um, and you would still be able to play at the same game. So, Yep, and a guaranteed loser. Yes. All right. <laughs> One last email at gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com. Player wants to come to Vegas about once a month, play 20 hours each trip, and he wants to make 50000 a year, which is going to be about $250 an hour. He wants to know from Richard and me, uh, can uh, you do it at blackjack or can you do it video poker? Now, I'll take the video poker game first, and the, the short answer rhymes with snow and has two letters in it. It's, uh, I do have some $250 an hour plays occasionally. I am not going to talk about them on the radio. Certainly, I have no idea if any will be in effect, say, the third weekend of September when uh, this guy was going to be playing. A lot of the good plays you have to go scout out and find. Now, the 50000 a year, I definitely can exceed that, but it's a lot more than 20 hours a week, and uh, it's feast or famine. Yeah, well, in regards to blackjack, he also said he had a $50,000 bankroll. So um, you'd be grossly overbetting your bankroll if you were betting enough to make $250 an hour. Second, um, you might last uh, through one trip of 20 hours before you were barred at every place in Las Vegas and flyered all over Las Vegas. Um, and, and if you want a hobby to make money in your spare time, playing blackjack and video poker, I actually think Vegas is the worst venue for you to select. Um, Better than Salt Lake City. Yes, worst gambling venue. Uh. Um, but, uh, I mean, it seems to me from the reports I hear that video poker is much better at your local casino in some other state than Nevada uh, than it would be flying in and, and playing it here in terms of what they will give you in mailers and, and those kind of things. And um, and often the blackjack. I mean, uh, the the management of casinos and their knowledge about card counting gets exponentially stupider the the further you uh, go from Las Vegas. So um, yeah, I would I would uh, pick uh, any place other than Las Vegas, and and I would not plan on being able to make your fifty thousand a year off your fifty thousand dollar bankroll. All right. So uh, let's talk to our guest. Jimmy Vaccaro is probably the most well-known bookmaker Las Vegas has. He's been a bookmaker in Las Vegas since 1975. His first job was given to him by Michael Gaughan, who then owned the Royal Inn. Now, Michael Gaughan owns the South Point, and that's where you'll find Jimmy Vaccaro. Jimmy, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Well, thank you very much for having me, Bob and Rich. It's a pleasure just listening to... Someone who has uh, is an authority on some subjects. I learned uh, a little bit so far on, on blackjack uh, and uh, advantage players with the slot. So it's my pleasure to be here. All right, about that first job. The story is you didn't know much about being a bookmaker when Michael Gaughan hired you. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, when you say didn't know knowledge of a bookmaker, I grew up around it all my life, but I wasn't a bookmaker growing up back east. Uh, but I surely knew enough about it. I played um, what you would consider, you know, uh, playing uh, from an early early stage. I just understood it. I understood the gambling scene. And, and then uh, in 1964, <laughs> about 10 years before I actually came out here, I, uh, I, I got my guys together, and I just had to see what Las Vegas was all about. It was a childhood dream. So at 18 years old, I packed every packed my friends up and drove out here and and I'm sure you two could uh you know emphasize this also you can go back to those years when there was really no kids allowed in the casino so we stood out like a sore thumb and we hit the gold nugget and was thrown on about five minutes uh, went to Binion's was thrown out about three minutes my friends gave up they stayed in the car but I was just uh, I was just bent on seeing what it was like being inside a Las Vegas casino so I went for the next few hours bounced around between the gold nugget to uh, 
and the uh, and Binion's Horseshoe. And then we stayed in one of those little, you know, motels that used to be across the street from the Mandalay Bay. And I uh, hung around for about two and a half days, but I was just absolutely taken by what I had seen. So uh, when I turned 21, I would just come out uh, when I could, whether it was with a junket or just gathering up a little bit of money of my own that I had won back home and then flying out here and actually getting broken about a day and a half and then going back home. So uh, this went on for a few years. Then one day that uh, I said, hell, I might as well just, I'm just going to go there and try it. I know that it was in my blood to be a, be a part of the casino operation. So uh, I landed here uh, right after the first day of uh, January 1975. And, um, uh, uh, just knew it. someone said, well, just go see this guy, Michael Gaughan. He's really a nice guy. And I actually burst into Michael's office with about $4 in my pocket and pretty brazen, as Michael tells the story now. And I said, I want to get started. And he picked up the phone. And, you know, at that time, Michael had a dealer school, which was downtown located by the El Cortez. And I had to get started somehow in the uh, in the in the business. So uh, I said, I'll do anything. I'll go to dealer school, whatever. So he picked up the phone, called to the dealer school and said, I'm sending this kid down, uh, teach him how to deal 21. And they looked at me and said, do you have any money? And I said, no. He started laughing. Uh, the guy on the other end of the phone was uh, was told, just let him start. When he gets the money, he'll pay. If I remember correctly, it was $250 for this, to learn how to at least deal 21. Then in those days, uh, you know, you didn't uh, actually apply for jobs. You were just, uh, you went to school, then you went and auditioned as much as you could. But remember also at the time, Michael at the uh, Royal Lynn Casino, which was located between the Stardust and, and the, the Hilton, the convention, on convention Center Drive, so you would audition. So I, I, I went three three day, three day times a day to dealer school. I went in the morning, the afternoon, and I went at night. I just had to get started, so I was pretty adamant on what I what I wanted to do. So uh, after about just simply about uh, 12 or 14 days, uh, uh, you went to the Royal Lynn and you auditioned, and Frank Cody, who was... Michael's right hand man, and still is, still is, uh, would would watch uh, the auditioning dealing, and then uh, uh, I I played lucky to some degree, and I went and and uh, Frank hired me as a twenty one dealer, so uh, that to me was a huge break. I just had to get started. I, I, you know, I got my gaming card and was ready to go. But shortly after that, I want to say uh, six or eight months later, I was called upstairs, and it was Michael again, and he looked at me and he said. Do you know how to run a sports book? And I said, no. He said, good, neither do I. He says, we're going to start one now. And that's, uh, he made me the boss of the sports book, which was, wasn't even started downstairs. We were, we literally were taking bets, uh, on a card table and a simplex machine and a handwritten, uh, way to, way to give the bets to the customers. And uh, it took about, uh, not too long, maybe 20, 21 days. We had this little in the corner three, ticket window operation and and uh, that's how I got started so uh, you know I really owe a lot to Michael he, he had enough faith in me to to know that I could probably you know help with the bookmaking side of it and, yeah, and why, there why you? everything else would change <clears throat> Jimmy why you I mean you'd only been there six months <laughs> why? well why? you know you know you know Rich that is that's a million dollar question matter of fact I just hit every time I see him and anyway first of all you know every life is uh, challenges and choices, and sometimes you just play lucky. I knew I was going to get in the casino business. Uh, when I used to come out early, uh, I went to you know, the old Churchill Downs with Harry Gordon run. I, you know, I remember there was, there was only two casinos that had sports books in them. That was the Stardust and the Plaza downtown. But I, I knew friends and people who uh, you know were part of the big sports betting scene. And uh, so Michael just threw friends uh, that, that this father actually hung around with said, uh, this kid understands this racket pretty good. He's really young. I wasn't even 30 years old then. And uh, but to be absolutely honest, yes, it's Michael Gaughan. He could have picked a thousand people, but uh, he chose me to do it and basically changed my life forever. Mr. Gaughan's a pretty good judge of character. So, uh, <laughs> he's a good guy. He's uh, he's done all right with his his, his guesses. All right. I would think so. Now, uh, there's been some huge scandals in FIFA, the organizing body for men's soccer worldwide. The recently reelected president has announced he's going to step down as soon as his successor can be elected. Surely you guys at the sports book knew that soccer wasn't on the up and up. How do you see soccer reform affecting the lines you're going to be putting out? 
Oh, well, obviously, it's, it's like everything else in life, uh, Bob, and, and, and no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you do in life, there's always going to be something or somebody trying to take advantage of, in an illegal way. Uh, it's been there since the beginning of time, but we are much better at catching these things. Matter of fact, uh, uh, that is that thing was probably more political than anything else, but yes, getting down to the, it was just like, uh, you know, acquiring money that, uh, through ill-gotten ways. And uh, what it just makes you do is just perk up your ears. Now remember, uh, soccer isn't the major income of the sports book here. So uh, when you consider what happened, uh, you know, th that money doesn't show here. That money was all played, you know, in, in foreign countries. Uh, uh, we, we, we do watch a little bit closer, but, but how you watch closer to anything you, you fully don't have full control or full knowledge of it is simply limiting the amount that they can bet. Now, naturally, uh, with the World Cup last year, as you can see, it was like a Super Bowl Sunday for 30 days. It was very apparent that uh, uh, what you saw on the field was like a leg was legitimate. So we, you, you could take higher action on all those games because, first of all, uh, the turnout was unbelievable. Uh, the people who bet bet from anywhere from $10 to $2,000 on the game. When you have that type of uh, thing going on there, uh, the transparency will show. And what we have always called unnatural money uh, something that would perk your ears up never really showed in the soccer here in other words there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't a game that like opened minus a dollar 20 and closed you know three three dollars on it on the side and, and that's what usually happens to anybody who's in in the process of trying to cheat you they all get greedy sooner or later uh, the biggest probably scandal that that we went through here in Las Vegas was 94 when Arizona State uh, uh, obviously had the players who were uh, throwing games here. And it, it was the fourth game, and we start picking up on the sense of unnatural money actually in game two. And they got so greedy by the time it was game four, they had bet so much money that we just alerted uh, our compliance people, and our, and our compliance people know notified game and control game and control uh took the ball from there but anything bob whatever it is the greed always gets you but it, but you know are we more transparent now yeah we watch a little bit closer uh we actually you know uh uh even nevada gaming has stepped in if we get things called suspicious money if we get things called that we we question people at times of getting large sums uh, are you betting this for yourself or someone else uh, we are way ahead of the rest of the world as far as watching out for these things. So uh, remember, the last thing that a bookmaker wants, especially in a regulated process or in here in Las Vegas, is something shady. We don't want people feeling that they got cheated out of their money. First of all, it's bad business for us. But uh, getting back to the soccer, it's not something that, that changes the course of your win or loss for the month. But, but yes, uh, we all watch a little bit closer, and we'll go from there. But uh, that's the essential thing. It blows everything up. Uh, I've been, in, I've seen three or four of these major things start, and uh, we catch them before that really gets crazy. So that's actually the way that we do it anymore. You mentioned that you you ask them, "Are you betting this money for you or yourself?" And that brings up this story, Bob. You want to about the pools? This new law about pooling the action. Yeah, last week the governor signed a bill saying now sportsbook can accept bets from betting pools. Now, Correct. it's supposed to be a big deal. I don't understand it. I mean, isn't this the opposite of the anti uh, the uh, messenger betting law? I mean, it seems like those two laws conflict with each other. Well, actually, they're trying to condense them. It's like uh, instead of being a messenger better, like if you want to come, and it's going to be a little more uh, lengthy to do this than some people think it is. In other words, what you're trying to do is like get everybody together. If you want to be a part of a of a group that wants someone to bet your money, obviously, you know, to some degree, that's a messenger better also. But you will have to uh, fully disclose who you are before you even do it. You will have to fully disclose everything that almost like the banking act uh, that you have to do it. And here's the thing that uh, a lot of people don't understand why I think it's going to take a little longer to get into uh, stride even if it gets there uh, let's say that uh, let's say you guys you know live in New York City and you want to be part of a group who plays plays your money for you okay and you want to give thousand dollars ten thousand hundred thousand whatever it is you don't when you come to Las Vegas or Nevada to do it you don't come to the sports book to do it you have to go to a bank 
you have to deposit the money just like everything else and then you naturally you have to go identify yourself who you are how much money you're depositing whatever and then the bank transfers the money to us so as you can see this is going to be a long lengthy process it's really uh, it's really more of a of a, uh, of a process of watching where the money comes from and that basically you know i hate to use this word money laundering but uh, it's an easier way to keep track of things so yes i guess you're trying to eliminate the runner uh but yes you're trying to also do it legally and you can if you want to but it's not going to be as easy to say yeah i want to be part of a group I want you to bet me a thousand dollars a game on all the games that you know that that you you're betting on or whatever. But you just can't do that undercover. You must come, and we must know who you are before it even happens. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, but, but, at least to some degree, it's going to be you know something new. Uh, uh, we have to tear this wall down, and hopefully, it's just another another brick coming off the wall where. Uh, this thing will go legally nationwide, which I think will will take care of all the ills of stuff like this. So, I mean, if the if they could accept money from other states, so are you saying mm-hmm. that this would allow people to gamble legally from other states by investing in this pool in Nevada if they live no. in another state? No, you no, you can't call you can't call me up uh, if, you, if you live in Iowa and say, Jimmy, I want to bet on the Cleveland Cavaliers. No, but I but if uh, but people, this law would allow me. Those people will be here. But we're making the best for you. But but I could invest in it living in another state. Yes, yes, you can. Oh, you okay. Now, to, you, but but you must come to Nevada first to fill out uh, to fill out everything. Well, you somebody has to come money. to Nevada. You got to you got to do that. You got to identify yourself. Okay, I see. So okay, but but I mean the problem is, uh, you know, Billy Walters fills out the forms and says, you know, here I am, I'm Billy Walters, and then tries to go bet. Nobody's going to take that bet. Well, I'm not going to get into like you know, but I mean that's a that's just a personal side, and and, and whatever happens with that happens with that. I'm just telling you the legality of you living somewhere else, and you want to be, a, and you want people basically to make bets for you, or just be a part of a of a group that wants uh, you know that wants to play. Uh, that's all I'm going to get into as far as like who's betting it, and where they're betting it, and what they'll accept. Uh, that's I just, see. Uh, that's truly another subject. All right, let's change gears a little bit again. Daily fantasy sports is a form of online gambling, but they're defined in such a way that officially they're not gambling, which, of course, is nonsense. Do you see daily fantasy sports helping or hurting the Nevada sports books? Uh, Daily fantasy football, if it were legal everywhere, we'd, we'd write more money on fantasy than we write on the games itself. That's how big fantasy uh, sports has got. That's another big hurdle that must uh, be cleared. Uh, there's uh, a lot of cloudy things involved in it. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, from a humble beginning uh, in the mid '70s of a, of a few, you know, friends getting together and playing fantasy football, it's grown to this forget million dollar industry. It's a, a multi billion dollar industry now the fan duels and, and the rest of those outfits that do it uh i i to some degree don't understand it we we can't do it the way that they do it because basically until uh, a lot of things change here in nevada i won't use the word it's illegal to do here in nevada but it, you don't see uh casinos or sports were jumping in there and offering this type of thing yet because it is really unclear now the i guess if you want to use the word hypocrisy to other parts and people are involved in you surely have the right to do so, uh, and the and the biggest uh, and, and the biggest opponent we have naturally is the NFL. Uh, the NBA, I think, would do it. Uh, hockey, I think, would do it. Baseball, I'm sure, would do it. It would generate uh, generate more money for them. But uh, where the where all the money's at, it's in. Uh, if you could fantasize, uh, what it'd be like if uh, once again, if you lived. Uh, out of the state, and you could send in your fantasy team every week. It is a unbelievable business. Uh, people gravitate towards it. And as I said, if you could do this from somewhere else, and we could do it here in Nevada, uh, we it would it would be bigger than writing writing the money on the games itself. That's how big fantasy football is gone. Yes, we understand that. As I used the word before. Uh, the hypocrisy. We see the ads now that run on sporting events, but we can't do them here. The NFL obviously is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. As you know, we can't even use the word Super Bowl 
uh, we we must say championship game on our tickets and on our promos. Uh, about twenty some years ago, they came to us and uh, they they start saying if if you don't pay to watch our games in your sports books, uh, we're going to cut it off or the signal will never even get to your state. So from that particular point in time, we have a yearly fee that we pay to the NFL directly to, uh, well, it does go directly, it goes to DirecTV, then I'm sure they chop up the money uh, the way that they do things. But we, we wouldn't even be able to show the game. And way back when it was in square footage, I believe, uh, I'm just a guess. I think the first year that they start charging, I was at the Mirage, I want to say like 1990. And I, I think a casino at that time with the square footage that we had in our sports book, they were charging us $25,000 a year to view the games on Sunday. Now, uh, that figure has gone up five, six, seven, eight, ten times since that point because, uh, Jeez. they got us by, they got us by the, the, the Whatever you want to term short uh, curlies. Yeah, if, yeah if, we don't, if we don't, if we don't pay it and don't have the games, well, that's silly because everyone else will walk across the street to watch a game. So whatever they want to charge, they're going to get away with it. But uh, the but fantasy such thing now is huge, and I, I hope someday that we can uh, book it like they do here and offer huge cash prizes. It would be phenomenal. Now, speaking of the NFL and fantasy sports. Uh, Tony Romo, quarterback of the Cowboys, popular player, got a bunch of guys, a bunch of football players together and was going to have a fantasy football convention where people pay $100 and go in and meet all these players and going to be held at uh, Sands Convention Center here in Vegas. And the NFL came down with a big boot and say, nope, we don't want any players or team owners to be have anything to do with places with casinos and uh, squelch that, and so they'll they'll have it next year in Los Angeles. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's very apparent to what we just spoke about a little bit earlier. Uh, They're they're the gorilla. You know, whatever they say, what are you going to do, fight them? If you're a player, uh, you you just simply can't do it. Uh, When you associate the word casino and NFL, it's it's taboo, you know, and Goodell will never... Uh, we'll never come here and address it. We're never, we're never trying to sit down and figure a way out. It can be both a good for business. Uh, it'd have been a good week for the sand. And yes, it would have drawn extra people in and, and part of and a big deal. What, what we offer here in Las Vegas is like, uh, I've been here a long time and so have you guys. And uh, not because we live here, but there isn't a, there isn't a city in the world that does things better than that than Las Vegas. We have the space, we have the beautiful hotels, we have other things to do. Uh, would it change the course of history if Tony Romo and, and a bunch of guys came here and made a few extra dollars? But uh, I'm sure there'll be at least two or 3,000 extra people on every given day that they're here to, to be a part of what it is, you know, spending cab rides, buying things, or having dinner, going to show. But as I spoke, the NFL is a monster. Uh, they can do whatever they want to do. And even if you're a big time player, which Romo is, you don't want, you know, you don't want to be on the other side of Goodell. And so that's just the way it is. But End the, NFL, story. the NFL has to know that gambling drives their popularity. I, I just don't get it. Like, what is it that they're afraid of? Well, it's very apparent. You know, you said it. We all know that, but they do it. So it, uh, they're afraid of, uh, they're afraid of nothing. That's what it is. They just say that's the way it is. They keep they keep going back to use the word integrity of the game. I mean, so that's always their ace in the hole. They never really explain it and, and forget about fixing an NFL game. Do you understand that that uh, well, nothing in the world is absolute, but that is as close as you can get to absolute. What are you going to offer Tony Romo <laughs> yeah. to like you know have three interceptions in the game? That's an impossibility. But it's very simple. They never delve into it. They just said you know they don't want they don't want it associated with Las Vegas and numbers and, and everything else that goes with it. And the only word, if you listen to every speech they give, they use the word integrity ten times in the, in the space of a uh, space of their context of their speech. It's silly. It's erroneous. But. Uh, Goodell is never going to change his mind, I can tell you that. And this is just hypothetical because I surely have no information, the same as everybody else. But the only way it's ever, ever going to get to point B is simply is the, is the NFL 
gets a piece of everything that, that uh, uh, every legal book in the, in the world does if you want to book it. Uh, that's the only way that I think it's ever going to get to phase two is it still comes down to money. Can they make money doing it? And I think that that's the only thing. That's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we have uh, we have a person in Goodell who's uh, a staunch. We have a person in Goodell who obviously, well, what did I see? I saw the figures from, from last year. The NFL netted, uh, the whole industry netted $9.5 billion. So they're not going to be pushed aside easily. It's not like the hockey who maybe would want to have a little bit of gambling to, to ensure more people show up for the game. Adam Silver has been the only commissioner who stepped forward and said, uh, at some time, uh, we have to sit down and discuss where, where we go with betting. It's a very, very good first step. Uh, obviously he's a very powerful man, but, uh, uh, it, it'll never, it'll never get to where we want it unless uh, football is involved. All right. We're going to stay with the NFL, but a totally different subject within the NFL. Okay. Every year, you and the other sports books set season-long futures bets for the total number of wins each team is going to get. For the yep. New England Patriots and the, uh, the teams they face during the first four games of the year, whether or not Tom Brady's four-game deflate gate suspension is reduced on appeal definitely affects the odds on the Patriots winning those games. Correct. Now, you're setting the line. You have to make an educated guess as to what's going to happen on the appeal. Now, for me, based nothing more than a wild-ass guess, my crystal ball says the suspension will be reduced to two games. What does okay. your crystal ball tell you? Well, I'm probably with you on that one, Bob. I think it's going to be reduced, but the, the protection you have if you're running a sports book is you simply uh, you, you take that particular bet down until you find out exactly what it is. Uh, we see two games, four games, one game, no games would make a uh, would make a big difference uh, on booking uh, uh, how many wins and losses that the New England Patriots had. Uh, right now, be, before this all started, uh, New England Patriots were uh, you know, about a ten and ten and a half win season over or under at that number. So, like I'm saying, uh, there, there's no sense guessing. You take the guesswork out of it. And I believe uh, uh, most people have taken the, that proposition down. We at the South Point have uh, an educational guess. If uh, it came out at two games suspension, uh, you wouldn't see it move that much. You would say you would see juice moved on it. In other words, let's say if, if it was ten and a half under minus a dollar fifty, you might see you know ten and a half under minus two dollars. Because uh, remember uh, what what the Patriots have going for them. Uh, this isn't something that like happened on a Sunday. Then next Sunday, Brady's not going to play. Uh, they, whether he, whether he plays or not, the first game, uh, we know Garofalo is not the quarterback as Brady. But they they have all summer, and you have Belichick, and still have a Super Bowl winning team. So uh, that's not going to change too much. Uh, the odds on the first game will, but uh, the only trick when you change drastic changes is if it happens. Sunday night, and they play, you know, uh, next Sunday. But in this case, they have uh, they have 90 days actually to come up with a game plan with this kiddie quarterback. So the two games won't mean much. The four games uh, uh, makes them. It's about pick them to win that division uh, with probably the Miami Dolphins. They'd still be a favorite over the Dolphins, but they'd be a favorite over everybody in that division. But the odds would be less because four games is literally what it's uh, one forty, you know, twenty percent of the season. So uh, that, that's a big deal. So we'll see, and, and nobody likes New England everywhere. And uh, you know, the only chance to beat these guys maybe would be is like Brady not playing the first four games. Interesting, but you know, the the guy under the blanket is Bill Belichick. Uh, the guy's crafty. He understands. And and uh, again, they won the Super Bowl. And yes, Brady was a huge part of it, but just still a very very good football team. So. Change, yeah, depending on what happens. I think it's reduced only because uh, I think that uh, Goodell maybe just throws out an olive branch to uh, to Robert Kraft and uh, you know, listen, uh, take two games and go home. Uh, possibly that uh, you know, not, not going to. It's not going to be less. He's not going to. They're not going to say, well, okay, we're taking everything away. Uh, we're going to find you five million dollars in your first two draft picks in the next couple of years. That's not going to happen. Uh, Brady will not play in all 16 games this year. 
Now, you say you took the game off the books. Would you ever do it just by juice? In other words, if a normal spread, and I'm, I don't know what the spread is on futures, of maybe 30 cents between betting the over and betting the under, making right. it 50 cents or 60 cents because of the uncertainty. What, is that an option, or is that ever done? Yeah, yeah it's just uh, maybe the easy way to – let's say, let's say before all this stuff happened, uh, it was – Ten and a half wins for the season, minus a dime on both sides. It's basically a pick 'em situation. So if you bought, you were, you went to the window and says I want the Patriots over ten and a half wins, and you'd have to like a straight a pick 'em bet. You give me eleven hundred to win a thousand on the under because you think the Brady thing is going to hurt the team. They're not going to win eleven games. Okay. Now let's say I say okay, I don't want to go to ten. I'm just going to go to ten and I'm going to keep it at ten and a half, but I'm going to make you pay a dear price. So I may make you lay if you want to bet the under, you're going to have to have to, have to lay two thousand to win one thousand. You know, with the ten and a half, and if we adjust it way to the under, uh, you would have to lay a bigger price if you wanted what you would perceive as an advantage player. You're getting the New England Patriots under ten and a half games. But you're not just skating on uh, laying a dollar ten. You're gonna have to put up a lot of money uh, to win uh, to win your bet, only because uh, we know Brady won't be in that game. How do you, you you mentioned advantage players? How do you deal with advantage players? I keep them all in front of me. I want to know what's going on. The so-called advantage player, or wise guy, whatever it is. A lot of a lot of sports books have uh, have ways that they run their book. Uh, I've always contested that. Uh, you know, I don't want. I I never barred anybody from betting. Uh, I uh, I respect their play. I respect their play probably uh, more than maybe some other people do. I'm very conscious who who who, who I would consider you know someone uh, smarter than me in a situation. So I've always learned from those people. So the term that I've always used in the past 40 years is like I want these people in front of me as opposed to behind me or sending someone else in that I don't know. And but with that goes uh, you know. Uh, goes stipulations that uh, um, there's an understanding. You know, if uh, these are the rules that I want you to abide by, and uh, this is what well, if we can do this, we're all happy. You know, I, I don't want to just kick people out because they're smarter than me. I've always contended that people are smarter than me. It's going to make me smarter somewhere down the line. But there's always rules that that you want to put out there, and uh, I've never had a problem with a player uh, who directly came to me and said, Jimmy. You know, I want to do this. How much can I bet? And and um, he's kept his word. I've kept my word. And through thousands of those players in the last forty years, so uh, I I just have a little different feel. I I can see why some people don't want these people around. They're basically, you know, uh, uh, they don't all win all the time. I've known so-called wise guys who are dead ass broke. I also know guys who started with nothing have a pretty good bankroll and they're pretty effective in what they do. Uh, it's just simply a feel and understanding of, of the racket, and uh, that's the way that I like to do it. Doesn't mean. Anybody else from any other casino, they, they run their book the way that they they want to or be that uh, you know associated with the people upstairs. Uh, I, I've been relatively fortunate uh, when I started this. Uh, as we stated earlier, there wasn't a lot of books in town, and then when I moved to the um, the original MGM uh, with Kirk Corian, uh, they didn't understand the racing sports that much. They trusted in what my decisions would be, and the same thing with. Uh, with Steve Wynn when I went to the Nugget and the Mirage. So I came I came upon the scene, if you may say it that way, in an era where uh, the f people had really had to uh, believe in the guy in the sports world because they didn't know too much about that part of the industry. So I played pretty lucky with that. So, But getting back to your original question, uh, I, don't, I don't like to bar anybody. Uh, if they're a 58% winner, uh, you know, and, and I can utilize why they're making that bet and maybe I can benefit the book by uh, A, sometimes getting on the same side that they do or B, more importantly, no, where I can get off of a game because I know what they're looking for. So it's something that, as you two would know, just being around it, it's just, it's just a feel of an understanding of what the hell you're doing. Now, good. Let's, let's move on again. Okay. In theory, each... Um, Sports books try to have each side uh, laying a, a one ten, uh, to, to one ten to earn ten, and so if if you can get each side 
the same number of millions of dollars on both sides, then the book is guaranteed to end up a winner. Right. Now, it's got to be real tough to do in practice. And my question is, how often does the book take an intentional line, such as... A position. A position, meaning, uh, let's say, you think the Cowboys are a little bit better than the line, and so your book is going to be a half point different than the other books in line, and you intentionally take that kind of a position. How often does that happen? Uh, not as much as people believe it does, but uh, it's very simple. And I've said this uh, ever since I, you know, I felt that I understood what the hell was going on with this racket. It's simply my opinion is worth one bet. So if everybody in town has uh, sends a line out at, uh, uh, you know, Patriots minus six, uh, I may put it up minus five and a half or plus six and a half. And then, you know, take a bet on either side of that. Uh, but from that point after that is done, then you simply, you know, barring industries or in, in, injuries or weather or whatever, you just basically move uh, where the money pushes you to. But any big time bookmaker I've ever known or been around is like simply you put the first number up and you see where it goes from there. And I've always said that my opinion is worth one bet. So if I favor the Patriots, and uh, everybody else got the game six, and I favor them a little bit. I'll make it six and a half, knowing that I'm going to get a, a bite at plus a six and a half, then then go to, uh, then go to six with the game. And that, but from that particular point on, ninety five percent is just driven by you know where the money comes in. But to answer your question for the third time is simply uh, a good bookmaker sticks his nose in very little, less than people think that they do. Uh, so we just like to say, drive, drive the drive the money and drive the number wherever the money shows. But let's say that let's say that you have a line that's three, and you really don't want to move off of that three, and and right. the money is still all coming or or a lot of it is coming on one side. I mean, right. are, aren't you sometimes forced to 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 end up with a position because you because you don't want to move off that that particular three? You're dead on right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, the, the number that scares everybody that's booking the NFL is because obviously the, the three is the most prominent number. It shows, a, I think it shows 7% of the time, which uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot. Uh, and uh, you don't want to move off the three. What you're seeing a new wave of is like, uh, let's say you're getting a lot of money on the minus three, minus three, minus a dime, and then not to go to three and a half. You would just simply say, well, if you want to lay the three again, you got to lay a dollar twenty or a dollar twenty-five as opposed to a dollar ten. Uh, that's basically what where you're seeing it. It's just about every every place in the, uh, every book here in Nevada. But the the only difference is that the South Point Michael Vaughn, uh, the only thing he's ever told Bert Osborne, uh, the director there, is like he doesn't want to do that. He feels it's a little confusing to the customer. So you're right. We take a bigger position. Uh, on the minus three because uh, we don't go to three minus 20. If we want to get off some of that money, we just simply go to two and a half or the three and a half. Yes, there's liability there if the game falls three, but that's just a personal decision. Uh, 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 Michael doesn't want to confuse anybody, and at times it can get a little confusing. But uh, 99% of the books uh, now utilize moving the money instead of the number. But uh, they're, they're, you have to be careful with that uh, uh, on which way you move. Now you can utilize them, you know, maneuver with your money line a little bit instead of going off the three. But you're you're 100 percent correct. Sometimes you're just forced to do it, in which we are. Uh, we hope put it this way: if we have X amount of dollars that we want to book on a particular number, you know, we stay there. But if, if we get to uh, probably three times more than uh, we know, we wouldn't take if we moved it. If we moved it to three and a half, then we do that also. So a, a little bit of a game, but uh, you know we do it a little bit different. It doesn't make our way better or worse than anybody else. It's just the way that uh, you know. In this case, Michael gone wants it, so naturally, whatever he wants, uh, we do. Twenty-five years ago, this week, Buster Douglas became the yeah. only man to beat Mike Tyson <laughs> in a professional fight. Yeah. Now three months later, he had a fight with Evander Holyfield. Correct. Now, Jimmy, I've heard that you have a very interesting story about this, about the Douglas uh, Holyfield matchup, and we got about four minutes. Do you have a four-minute story? 
Oh, yeah. It's, uh, first of all, I was the only one who put odds up on the Tyson Douglas fight when he lost. Opened that fight up 27 to 1, Tyson the favorite, and that went to uh, uh, 40, 40 to 1, which is the number you see everywhere bandied about when the story comes up. So after the big upset came, uh, Steve Wynn wanted to get involved to some degree in, in uh, uh, booking uh, or, or signing a three fight deal with uh, Evander Holyfield. So uh, remember, he beat Douglas, uh, he beat Tyson in February, and then in November, I think it was late, late October, early November, uh, the big fight was Holyfield and, uh, uh, and Douglas was going to take place. Uh, Douglas trained at the Metro Mirage for six weeks leading up to the fight. And one quick story, I remember we're going to uh, San Francisco to promote the fight. It was during the World Series. And there was two private planes. One had Holyfield on and one had uh, a Douglas on. I was on the flight with Douglas. And uh, there was all this food that was in, being served as we were flying up to San Francisco. I can only tell you Douglas ate it all. That's for sure. <laughs> so, so when we got the back, uh, you know, Douglas never took his, his sweat uh Sweat top off when he was training in our room we had at the Roger. Never took it off. When we went to the fight, uh, we went to the pregame weigh in. Uh, when he took his sweatsuit on, and everybody saw how fat he was. Lou Duva always went, almost went crazy. He clocked in at 256 pounds. He had uh -huh. fought, uh, he had fought Tyson earlier at, uh, 229 pounds. So, uh, he ate his way out of the championship, got knocked out. Quickly, Steve Wynn wasn't very happy with it. Ended that contract, and uh, that was the end of the story. Uh, Douglas never, never, never recovered after that. Wow. All right. Uh, we've been speaking to Jimmy Vaccaro, a uh, legendary bookmaker here in Las Vegas. We have a ton of other questions for you. We don't have any more time today. We okay. uh, would love to have you back again if you can fit us in. It's a pleasure listening to a master okay. at his work. It's my pleasure, and I'll be uh, at my old age now. I got to take a. I need to recharge. So I'm going to take a, a month off, and uh, uh, we'll catch up near football season. Ah, uh, wonderful! Thank Perfect. you very much. All right, see you guys uh, later. He's a pleasure. Yeah, he's a pleasure, and. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk about some commercials. Uh, South Point has more than 10,000 gains, returning more than 99%. This is more than anybody else. In June, they're giving you two and a half times as much as your normal free play if you come in enough. If you usually get $50 a week or $200 a month, this month, if you pick up the $50 on a Monday through Wednesday, you'll get an additional $50 Friday or Saturday the same week. If you pick up all eight of those $50 amounts, you'll get an additional $100 on the last Monday or Tuesday of the month. So this, instead of the $200 you would normally get, you now get $500. So uh, that's the kind of promotion of um, that's pretty evenly spread out across the field. It's free play. That's good. Uh, at the Palms... On the weekly 7 p.m. drawings on Friday, uh, they give away $10,000 to a total of 10 people. Uh, don't have to be there to win. Must collect it before midnight. They have multiple drawing entries Friday afternoon and evening. Play for prizes, PFP, through this Friday, June 12th, will be free play. Uh, meaning uh, you play, say, 50,000 coin in, you get a $100 free play. Uh, the following two weeks, it'll be Fry's, which uh, is an electronic store. For last week, you get cash. One blog I read that getting cash is everybody's favorite gift. I disagree. Let's say you play $100 worth of either cash or free play. If you get the free play, they put it on your card, and you're done. You've played at this casino anyway, so the next time you're there, you just play it off. No big deal. But if you're going to get cash, it takes them longer to fill out the coupon for the cash than it did to put the free play on. Then you have to walk it across the casino to the cashiers, stand in line, show ID, and eventually get your $100 in cash. You're going to be playing anyway. So um, it's, uh, it's I would far prefer f uh, free play to cash. Can I think of situations like I'm leaving the country immediately and would prefer cash to free play? 
yes. But for players who play all the time, free play is a lot, lot better. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, which is eight ninety five a month or seventy nine ninety five a year, allows you to get corrections on most of the games. It's a good place to practice quick quads, for example. You can get the strategy from my website or Shaq's website, wizardofoz.com. But if you want correction, go to videopoker.com. Uh, for most players, you have no idea of how badly you really play until you have a computer program correcting your mistakes. The Game of the Week, they have a contest. The Game of the Week is 10 Play Dream Card. Dream Card is a 10 coin per line games where periodically you get the Dream Card, which is the very best card you could have given the first four. If you disagree uh, that it's the best card, you can change it easily. Um, then you get that card and you play your hand. If, for example, your first four cards are Ace, King, Queen, Jack of Hearts, and you get the Dream card, um, that's the Delt Royal. It's a lot easier to get four Royal cards in the first four cards in the Dream card than it is to get the five Royal cards. Um, there's no special strategy required. It is, uh, a slight benefit to the player, something like 0.05%. So bonus, 8.5 bonus instead of being 99.16 would be 99.21, something like that. Uh, and there's considerable variance. Um, and it comes with sound effects, which, uh, personally, they're annoying. I like the sound effects on quick quads, dream cards, not so much. All right. Uh, Jimmy Vaccaro was, uh, he was interesting. I could listen to him tell stories all day. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to get more of the betting stories. One of the things he didn't uh, mention about that uh, Buster Douglas story was when he saw the weigh-in, he saw how fat he was, he raced back to the book to go change the odds, and somebody beat him there by a minute and got a $50,000 bet down on Holyfield before he had a chance to, to change the line. So, Ah, uh, that... uh it pays to go to weigh-ins, I guess, if you're a big better. I guess, yeah. And to have your tennis shoes well, on. Well, nowadays you have cell phones, so you can change things a lot faster, right? Yeah, so could Jimmy. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Richard, if people wanted to get old shows, how would they do it? Uh, well, first of all, we welcome your questions. Uh, we we encourage you to send us your questions at gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com or facebook.com slash gamblingwithanedge. Or you can uh, Twitter them at me at RWM21. Um, if you want the shows delivered to you automatically every week, you can sign up for that at YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, or at richardmunchkin.com. Uh, and you can find an archive of all the old shows, uh, every episode ever done, at bobdancer.com. So. All right. Now, you mentioned tweeting. Um, I don't do tw- I'm not on Twitter, but I go on the internet and look at other Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> uh, Twitter, uh, periodically. And the best one I heard this week, and we're going to leave you with this, is grammatical rules are meant to be bended. So, <laughs> so thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. been listening to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin. Subscribe to the show in iTunes and episodes will be delivered to you automatically every week. Archived versions of past shows may be found at BobDancer.com and RichardMunchkin.com. We welcome emails at GamblingWithAnEdge at gmail.com. Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin are both available on Facebook and welcome your questions. The sponsors for the show are the South Point Hotel, Casino, and Spa, the M Resort, the Palms Casino Resort, and the website videopoker.com. Join us again next week for another Gambling with an Edge. Mommy.